George, we know that marketing is hard and it's hard to find things that are predictable. What would be, if someone were to ask you, what can you recommend without hesitation in, in building a marketing plan? Yeah, well, I mean, it all starts with your Google reviews because every other type of marketing you do funnels back to your reviews. You do direct mail, patients look you up. You do any sort of web advertising, they're gonna go to your reviews and see how you are. And if you're ever looking for like a high quality patient, who's picking you for not cost, for quality of care, which is the best types of patients, you know, you need to have great reviews. And so always starting with a Google review service like Swell that can get you a ton of reviews is going to set up all future marketing. And it's so inexpensive compared to marketing other costs that it's just the highest ROI thing you could ever do. In, in my mind, it's one of those, this is the first thing you do. And then we look at everything else. It's yeah. like, no matter what practice you're in, no matter what situation you're in, you start with Swell and then let's figure out the rest of your marketing plan. Like all my coaching clients and it's like, okay, get Swell, let it sit and bake, let you get all the reviews and then we'll start marketing when you have enough reviews to like really be impactful. So if you don't know where to start with your marketing plan, the easiest first step is to sign up for Swell. Go to swellcx.com slash shared practices to get the absolute lowest price on Swell through our exclusive promo. Again, that's swellcx.com slash shared practices to start getting more reviews with Swell today. Okay, welcome back. I have an official co-host here with me today. Welcome, Murray Lowe. How's it going? Uh, going good. Doing great these days. How about yourself? Good. So I, I'm like, do I call him dad? Do I say Murray? Murray, but I feel we got we to gotta be professional. I'm not going to make you call me Dr. Lowe, though. <laughs> I never have. I doubt I ever will. <laughs> I'm sorry. Sorry. Um, so this, this is an interview with uh, Sandy Pardue. And um, I have been co-hosting her season of her podcast. So that's at the end of this show. There's going to be a little call to action there um, where you can check out her podcast, Dental Drill Bits. Um, anyone from the online dental community of Dental Town, the Facebook groups, um, anyone who's been to a practice management course in the last five, 10 years knows who Sandy Pardue is and what an authority figure she is around practice management information. Um, and, and, and she's just been in offices. She's done this with team after team and, and does in office coaching works with people one-on-one. -on -one. And so I just love any time I have the ability to pick her brain, ask her questions. Um, it, it's, it's a joy for me. And, and I think everyone else gets, gets a lot out of it. And I think, uh, you know, you've listened to this now and, and we'll get in, into the interview here in a second. But you can tell that like, she's just been in the trenches. She has the experience and, and has a lot of good things to say. Yeah, and, and her experience, she's not an academic. She's a practitioner. So she goes in and she tells you the, the real goods, the real practical stuff that works and the stuff that doesn't work. Probably in a way that someone who hasn't been in this field for decades can't do. Uh, her insights and her ability to cut to the chase are just are based on uh, working with hundreds and hundreds of doctors, you know, you're supposed to have the 10,000 hours. She probably has 20 or 30,000 hours. And there's so, so there's so much uh, that she offers to the people that, that can listen to this. Okay, well, let's get into it with Sandy Pardue. Okay, welcome back to the Shared Practices podcast and Dental Drill Bits podcast. This is a combined episode. Um, I'm your host, Dr. Richard Lowe, and I have with me Sandy Pardue. Sandy, welcome to the show. Hi, Richard. This is going to be a good one. This is, we've been sick. It has been like three or four weeks since we recorded. I still have like a little bit of a scratch, like a teenager, you know. So if my voice cracks or breaks through the episode, I, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I hear you. Well, today we're at the beginning of a new season for Shared Practices. And in each season, we like to go deep on a set of topics that all go together. And for this season, I really want to focus on the role of a dentist as a leader. And you've broken down in, in other episodes of your show and of our show, this idea where a, a team member will, will create a Word document and outline in this Word document their duties. They're kind of almost like a checklist, like a blueprint, um, so that if someone else were to come in and, and take their spot, they would know what to do. They'd have all these things lined out and you'd have a system, you could hold them accountable. I kind of want to do the same thing for the dentist as a leader 
in the practice, in the business, and um, outline some of the bigger skills that a dentist needs to have and the things that they need to be doing on a regular basis to be a leader. How does, how does that sound to you? Oh man, that's, that is really needed. I, that's all I'm going to say. That is needed in dentistry for sure. Okay. I think it's so, definitely. okay. So let, let's get into this. Um, I, I can imagine it's got to be frustrating sometimes when you come into a practice you see the dentist, you see the team, the team is eager, you talk with the dentist, you figure out what their goals are. Um, eventually, though, there's got to be certain circumstances where you realize that it's the dentist that's the bottleneck, that's that's the problem. So I want to know when the dentist is the biggest problem, and maybe that's like 100% of the time, but what are the what are the big things that, that the dentist falls short on, and so therefore that they can work on as things that they need to do as a leader? Wow. Okay. So with this one, I'll tell you what happens. The dentist goes to dental school, learns how to be the dentist, right? Something mm -hmm. attracted the dentist to dentistry. A lot of times it's because they like the, the, the little, you know, tinker with the something. I don't know. It's the little mechanics or whatever, but it's not managing a bunch of women. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> out of dental school and oh my goodness. So here it is. There's so many things that need to be done in the practice. And the dentist is interested in being in the treatment room. And that's where you want the dentist, right? Because that's mm. where the income is generated. The dentist is the mechanic, okay? And they're generating the income, but then there's these women in there and who knows what they're doing. So this is why the dentist has to get organized and know everything that needs to happen in the practice first. So the most stress comes from the lack of organization. I will tell you that almost 100% of the time. So the, the dentist has to get organized and know what they're responsible for and what each section or area of the practice is responsible for. And it starts there. They are very much like, I love football. So, I, you know, especially mm. this time of year and I'm watching the coaches and the New Orleans Saints, of course, because they're my team. And so I'm watching and you, you watch the, the coach and you watch the interaction with the team and the coach is the one that's making it all happen. So in dentistry, the team is hired and they're really counting on the doctor. They're counting on the doctor for leadership. But how does the dentist become the leader? And that's that's where they get hung up. So first off, the first thing they have to do when they hire a team is to make sure that they have communicated as the leader what is wanted and needed from that team. OK, that that is really part of it. The next thing is they can't be afraid of their team. Just hmm. like a coach is going to look at the players and see who is the best for each position. And that's what the dentist needs to do. And you don't, you can't listen to a lot of noise in the practice. So, I mean, we're fans of practice by numbers, right? So right. practice by numbers gives the leader of the practice everything they need to know about who is performing in which area. And they need to get familiar with it. So what does the leader do? So they first, and they come in, you know, people are like, well, really, what is leadership? Okay, so I'm going to go to morning huddle and I'm going to tell everybody what they need to do all day. And I'm going to micromanage them. And that's the opposite of what the leader should do. Mm. So to all of the practice owners, they need to think, okay, do I have the right team? Do I have them in the correct position so that they can be the best that they can be? Mm. Do I need to make some changes? Have I helped them become good in those positions by telling them what they need to do and provided the training on how to be the best they can be and give me what I need? Have I given them statistics that align with their jobs? That's what a leader does. So a leader also inspires. A leader, part of the leader's job is to not only get what they need from their team, but to make them even better. So everybody should be better because they worked in that dental practice. When you have your entire team at that level, 
your stress goes away. Your life just got easier. Yeah. No. And, and you've said like, so I, there's like a list of now like 10 things in my head of like duties of leadership of the dentist, including knowing what your vision is, communicating expectations, training and empowering with statistics, um, not being afraid of the team. And oh, the, the, you, you said so many things that I'm like, man, each one of these could be like an episode unto itself. Um, I, I, I just, I think people get overwhelmed when they don't know where to start. And so if let's, let's frame this in, in, you know, the shared practices mindset of now we've transitioned. So say that this is the first year of practice ownership. If you were coming into a practice that's already kind of got some established culture, it's got established, somewhat established systems, somewhat established expectations, people have kind of been doing their thing for a while. What would you do first as a leader? Well, coming in, uh, you mentioned vision. Well, we need to make sure that the practice owner and team have worked on a vision and they have goals for the practice. So mm -hmm. A lot of times the practice owner has a vision, and I think that's important, but I also think that they should include the team in creating that vision. How do we want our practice to look in six months, in a year, and what are the goals that are going to get us to our vision? So let's list those out because that's what's going to get us there. So that's one of the first things that we're going to look at. But um, again, as the so so if, if you're looking at from a consultant's perspective, I can't help but look for missed opportunities. From a leader's perspective, they should always be trying to, I don't want to say get more, but grow and improve. Nothing in life stays the same, right? It gets better or it gets worse. So you you need to know your score. I and mean, I'm going to tell you like that, that is like you, you need a scoreboard. That is the next thing that has to happen. And for dentists, many, many dentists, they don't want the scoreboard. They're like, you know what? I really don't want my team to know what my production is and my collections. And I'm like, dude, you know what? They can add. OK, they can yeah. add and they know what you're producing and collecting. So, you know, it, I don't want to make it. And some listeners may be thinking, oh, gosh, you know, here's a consultant. She's going to make it all about the money. No, 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 no. No, I'm not. But I do know that you need a scoreboard. When I go to an LSU game and it's halftime and I run to the concession stand and come back, what's the first thing I do if this game's already started? I'll look up at the scoreboard, right? Mm -hmm. It's like you the scoreboard tells you how you're doing. And if you need to make some changes, you need to hire somebody, you need to do some more training. So the leader in the practice is going to make sure there's a scoreboard. Okay, cool. I like that. So I, I think that's an extremely concrete first step that that whether you're a new dentist or an established dentist, a lot of people haven't done. So it's like if, if we're playing a game as a team, everyone needs to know the rules of the game. They need to know how we're doing. And I, I think you, you nailed it when you said that a lot of people think, oh, this is going to be this high pressure situation. But in reality, it comes down to, you know, if you have a bad day, if you have a bad week, you have a bad month, you at least want to know that. It, that doesn't mean that, you know, you get all crazy and grumpy and frustrated and upset, but like, man, you need to know what's up. And if you're not watching the score, if your team's not watching the score, then like, how do you even know until after the fact you look back and you say, hey, oh, I guess we had a crappy collection or, you know, we, we had a ca crappy production. And it's too uh, late to do anything it's too late to do anything. So, um, that's, that's an extremely like tactile first step of your team needs a scoreboard, um, as an office as a whole, and then as individuals specific to each position. That's right. And so as a leader, you, you, the team may, I'll give you a great example. This just happened last week. I know that a practice needs to outflow. OK, that's an outflow of calls, an outflow of emails, an outflow of recall cards. You might send notes, thank you notes, thank you letters, no cavity letters. Guess what happens when you start sending no cavity letters out to kids with no cavities? Guess what? 
the moms start telling the whole soccer team and you get more new patients and more families. Mm. So outflow is always going to equal inflow. So the more outflow, the more you get back. So I have sometimes practices that say where the team will say, well, we don't send letters. Okay. (laughs) Well, maybe you should send letters. Your new patient numbers are really low. Maybe it'd be a good idea to send some letters. Hmm. And, um, but the doctor, the, so the team's deciding and the doctor is scared to ask the team to send letters. And the doctor thinks it's a great idea. You know, it'd be really good if we welcomed patients into the practice with a welcome letter, but the team doesn't want to do it. And the doctor's scared to tell the team member. This is okay, so, happened. Okay. So, so why, why is this and what can a doctor do to overcome this? You know, it's like, it's, it's so funny that I I don't think that they're scared of, you know, like literally scared. It's more of like getting people to do something that they don't want to do is uncomfortable. And, and it's like delivering bad news to a patient. It's like, as a parent, when you've got a kid who's, you know, disobeying and, and and you need to, you know, lay down the law. It's just, it's just not fun. It's not comfortable. And and I think a lot of times doctors want to be liked by their team or they don't want to have to hold people accountable if people don't buy in and, and aren't following them. So what would you tell someone who like knows what they need to do, but is afraid to do it because they're afraid of team pushback? Well, I think a lot of times the team doesn't want to do something because they don't have a full understanding of how helpful it could be, right? Mm. Or how not doing it could affect the practice in a negative way. So communication, there you go with communication again and uh, making them responsible. So what we do is we actually have them report at the team meeting how many letters they sent. Okay. So now Mm. they didn't want to do the letters now comes to the team meeting every month and reports how many letters? Now she's not going to want to say, oh, I didn't send any. Okay. Because everybody's reporting their numbers. When it comes down to welcome letters, she's going to want to say 35. And that was up from 30, right? So right. Uh, that is one way. And then explaining to Susie, because a lot of times they these, these people have no experience in business. So they don't understand how you need to promote. When you send out letters emails, all of those, it's its like marketing. It's a form of marketing for the practice. It's not going to mm. shrink the practice. You're actually going to do better. I could, I've counted like letters going out and noticed that within four weeks, what happens to the numbers? They start going up. You get more mm. new patients. So you'd send mail out, you know, direct mail, things like that. So it's a matter of, I think, laying out the expectations, communicating what's wanted and needed, And then having the follow up with the statistics. Another thing that the doctor can do, one of the best leaders I've ever known in dentistry, a dentist with uh, an amazing practice. What he would do is he he had a, a place that he would write down every time he asked a team member something. He had a a list. It was a form, and he put the date, who it was, and what he requested. And so every morning he just flipped it open and he could see, and he had a a large team, he could see who he made a request to. And that was his way to follow up. And he never forgot anything. And Mm. everybody that worked for him knew, guess what? He's not going to forget. So it was a matter of a system of following up. And that's a form of leadership. Seeing things through is a form of leadership. That's very important. And that same doctor would go to a team meeting and have the team report their numbers and he would just take those notes and make not make any comments just take notes and know exactly who was doing their jobs and uh, you know richard there's something that i talk to a lot of dentists and when they call me i can tell from a phone call in the beginning when they just uh, acquire a practice or they they're going to do a startup the questions that they're asking you can kind of tell who's going to be the guy that's going to have two or three practices and who's going to be the guy that's going to hit that million dollar mark after a few, you know, like a year or 18 months. You know, it's, it's really because they're, they're the leaders. You can, you can hear it in their tone of voice because you know what they're asking? 
They're asking, how can I be better? Mm. How can I learn more? How can I do this? And just being vocal about it and getting those answers. That's all leadership. So having a plan and following through, that's leadership and not being afraid of your team. One of the things I love about Zen Supplies is the ability to track your current stock of everything using their iPad app. When your team each week goes to restock, and restocking should not be a daily occurrence mid-procedure, restocking should happen once a week, and they take the app and they zen out items that they are taking from the centralized supply. Some offices even put a lock on the centralized supply, and the only time you can access it is once a week. That will update with your online platform so that you know exactly where your levels are. You can set your min and your max, give yourself a buffer, so that you're ordering what you need for the next two weeks. This keeps you lean and mean. You don't need three months worth of composite that's probably sitting in a cabinet expiring because of a buy five, get one free deal. So this all circles back and works together. If you can integrate this philosophy where you are ordering For only two weeks worth of supplies, you're restocking once a week and you're zenning out using the app so that you know exactly your current levels of every supply, then it becomes a click of a button to restock and reorder and compare prices at the best possible deals and get your overhead down. 4% overhead is possible via Zen Supplies. Go to zensupplies.com slash SP to get $200 off your first year's subscription. Click the button to request a demo today. Zen Supplies, let's get organized. Okay, I love it. So we've said scoreboard. We've said not being afraid of our team by having them hold themselves accountable and also by us following up and just having a system of follow-up so that it's not something scary. And then being humble and and having that desire to be better. And I I think that it, it it baffles me sometimes, like sometimes in the podcasting circles, you run with a lot of people who are very much excited to learn and excited to grow. And then you go talk with someone who doesn't listen to podcasts, who isn't, you know, trying to improve themselves. And you just like realize like, wow, like some people just don't care as much about learning about improving and 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 it's just weird to realize like oh wow okay if you if you aren't reaching your goals but you don't really want to figure out why then then how you know like of course you're not reaching your goals at that point if you're not hungry for it if you're not willing to ask willing to learn willing to be humble then then absolutely that makes sense so yeah. that humility is 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 key it's hard. It's hard to find though, unless someone actually already has that. I mean, so what would you say to the doctor who's asking, "How can I have more humility?" Already has humility. The doctors who don't have humility, they're going to have to get humbled somehow, which is which is hard to do, unfortunately. And sometimes that comes with experience. But one more thing about uh, what we were talking about: when your team is pushing back on something, just remember that a lot of times it's because they're missing some data. So they're, mm. they don't understand why they they need to do that. And so I found just from training just hundreds and hundreds of team members, once they hear, oh, okay, now I understand why I need to do that. It's not just something you're asking them to do to keep them busy. There's a reason. And then I think even with kids, when you're raising kids, once they they understand how it's going to work, they're, they're, they'll jump into it. Have you ever noticed that? It's like, and so grown ups are the same way. <laughs> well, and I, I think that for some people, in my mind, there's like three things that come to mind. One is some people need to understand the explanation, like the logic behind it. And once that clicks, then they're just like, okay, I got it. I'm good to go. Other people, I feel like, need to experience it. And so it's almost like you kind of, they, they're like, you can tell them why, but they're like, eh. but mm-hmm. then once they actually do it and they see the results, then they've bought in. That's right. And, and then unfortunately, there's also some people who just need to know that you're going to actually keep following up until this gets I done. I say that because if they think, <laughs> like if, the, if you ask them to do something and then they do it and you're like, okay, good, do it. And then you don't ask, they drop it out. 
So that's why you need that accountability that's built into your systems. That's why we've talked about this before. I love team meetings where the team, they bring their statistics. They go to practice by numbers. They maybe, you know, uh, capture their, what they need to report or whatever it is. And they come and they say it out loud. That's that accountability. And so mm-hmm. practice owner, that, that's how they're getting what they need, but they're keeping the accountability in place, you see. You can no, just absolutely. get about it and know it's all on the computer somewhere, but then where's that accountability? No, for sure. And and that like that knowledge that I'm going to be held accountable for this on a consistent basis is sometimes, unfortunately, the only thing that gets people to change is when they finally give in to, okay, this isn't going away. This isn't some fad. This isn't something that if I can just hold out for a month or two, then the doctor is going to forget about it and not care anymore. And it's um, the only way you're going to push your numbers up. Yeah. And I'm going to be doing it. Why not do, Why not go all the way and be successful and do really well? And, you know, no. that's another topic actually for a podcast is, is a uh, high production and collections doesn't have to equal stress, right? <laughs> yeah. Well, <laughs> yeah. And, and, and ironically, you know, we've had some examples on, on our podcast recently where, um, as doctors delegate more and have systems and identify uh, kind of possibilities and, and points of friction, eliminate those points of friction, they're they're producing more and they're less stressed and they're doing it on less time. How how would you help someone who feels the need to control as a leader, who's very much a micromanager, who has a hard time? trusting that someone else is going to care about this as much as they do you know and what? go ahead when do you know how many team members tell me that their doctors micromanage it's endless almost all the team members the <laughs> problem in practice doctor is a micromanager so i know why doctors micromanage okay they micromanage because they have the debt they have the responsibility. The buck stops with them. Man, they they have the worry. They have they have to take care of the team and their families and all those patients and the stress that comes with that. And I, that's why they micromanage. They need to know that things get done. So that's why the systems. And I know we keep talking about systems, and but it's true. It's like that's the only way that they're going to know that things get done. So you hear systems, systems, but what are Real systems give the doctor the information without the doctor micromanaging. Doctor knows if something falls out immediately with the right mm-hmm. systems. They have to be connected, like we've talked about before. So that's why doctors micromanage. They're not organized. They don't have the right systems. So as as a doctor, as a as a leader, you can either spend your time and energy and effort micromanaging people. Or you can spend your time and energy building systems and then having those systems be a way to um, feel comfortable with the level of control and the level of quality that's going on in your practice. That's it. That's correct. And here's the thing. Uh, You're not going to be able to keep team members that are being micromanaged. They're not going to they're not going to want it. It'll be hard to get people to stay long term. Nobody wants to work like that. And you want to think as a leader that you're going to develop the the areas of your practice so that those people are the managers of their own areas. And you can go back to football. If you're going to have a team, okay, and now you've got a dental team or you're going to go to football team. And if they didn't practice and get better and better and better, they're they're not going to win. So the same Mm. in the dental office. So if you've just got bodies sitting in those chairs, just warm bodies there, and they're not able to solve problems and and develop good relationships with your patients and represent really well, guess what? You'll never be the Chick-fil-A of dental practices. You know, Mm. you're going to be the McDonald's. And um, that's just not what, especially in this climate with insurance climate, you, you can't be that. You have to be more. So you want the best team performing at the highest levels. And that's only going to happen from your leadership. So how would you, how would you encourage a doctor who maybe hasn't thought about this before 
of like developing team members rather than just having them do their their position. You know, it's like, what's the difference between micromanaging and empowering others? You know, how how do you trust a team member to do something more? Uh, I don't know. I'm just having a hard time coming up with a concrete example. Okay. You, I, I'm I'm struggling here. Okay, so you could just take any position. Let's take the scheduling position. So you're a, you're a dentist, and uh, maybe let's just take somebody that's fairly new to practice, and so they have the scheduler, and she doesn't like to talk on the phone. All right, this is a real life example. Okay, so yeah. here's the dentist. He borrowed a lot of money. Okay, and uh, his schedule is open. And you ask about the person in charge of the schedule, which should he should have appointed or, or you know, the dentist should have appointed. You're the scheduler. You're responsible for filling the schedule. And that person says, but I don't really like talking on the phone. And you've got five hundred thousand dollars worth of unscheduled treatment. And you've got that can, that is real. That's real world, by the way. In most practices, most practices just haven't looked. And uh, you've got 700 people needing a cleaning today, and she doesn't want to talk on the phone. Hmm. So at that point, I mean, what are you going to do? So I would put a statistic on her. I'd say, okay, Susie, so I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, let's organize your your position here. Here's some reports. Here are people that are due for recall and people that are due for unscheduled treatment. Now let's practice some verbal skills now because you don't want to, you want to take time and make sure they know what to say on the phone, right? Mm -hmm. They're in your practice. So you're going to make sure they know what to say, maybe even have it in writing in front of them. And then from there, they're going to have a list. And now you want to track the calls. How many calls did they make? How effective were they? And she has to be accountable for them. If you don't see her filling this out or you don't see the accountability there, she's not the right person for your practice. But I always ask, what did I not do? to make that person better at their job. I always ask that. Oh, okay, you know what? Maybe I didn't spend enough time with her. Let me try this. If it doesn't improve, you are wasting your time. And if you as a leader of your practice are the coach, you can't keep people that aren't producing. Hmm. You can't. You don't uh, so so there's a few things that that really stand out to me there and and one of them is um the concept that Jocko Willink in in the book Extreme Ownership really lays out where he says there are no bad teams only bad leaders and really at the end of the day taking ownership for everything that happens in your office and if if a team member is struggling that's because you haven't set them up for success in terms of expectations, in terms of training, in terms of accountability and um, access to resources. And, you know, a lot of times we just want to blame other people and point fingers when in reality, if we take that attitude, even if it's, I think it's, it's even if it's not technically true, like, you know, you can say everything is, is on me. And if you're not succeeding at the front desk at filling our schedule, that's my fault. By saying that and saying that to your team member, um, that makes them also want to take that same attitude of ownership and accountability. And you're not coming down, you know, when they're when they're struggling, when they're failing, you're not coming down on them and saying, why aren't you filling the schedule? You know, what's wrong? We talked about this last month and you haven't done it. You're saying, you know what? this is my fault. We're having a hard time getting this schedule full. I want to make sure that I've given you absolutely everything and, and, and going at it from that attitude of humility and ownership before saying, you know what, I'm going to fire this person because they're, they're, they're not doing what, what they should be doing. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. So again, I mean, I've been doing that forever. It's like, what have I not done? And then taking that responsibility, what can I do more to help that person? Because you don't want people to fail. Uh, that's not good for the practice whenever you, you're always changing team members and now they're leaving the practice and going to say bad things about you around town. You know, so you want people to succeed. So then you know you tried with that person and they're still not getting it. That's when you need to replace them. But at least you tried and you need to improve your hiring skills for the next time. So that mm. it doesn't keep happening again and again. 
So I, I want to ask one more thing here uh, before we wrap this up. So how do we deal with conflict in an office? I feel like that's something as a leader that conflict is going to happen. Unfortunately, drama is going to happen, whether it's big or small. Some offices have a whole lot more of it and the drama is a whole lot bigger. Um, but even the, even the best offices have personality conflicts or misunderstandings. Um, and, and I feel like some of those pivotal moments can really sour one way or another and, and can shift the feel or the culture of an office one way or another. If everyone's afraid of, you know, how things are handled when, when drama or conflict comes up. Um, what have you seen that dentists do or need to do to okay, handle well, conflict? I've certainly seen a lot on this topic. I always think when somebody asks me this question, I think of an office that I worked with a long time ago in Ohio. That is an amazing practice. And um, they had a team agreement. That was the first time I'd ever seen an, a, a team agreement. And so, and it was very effective. So that they more or less sat down together. This isn't something the doctor creates. In fact, the doctor's not supposed to. There's actually, you know, if it ever came back with a labor, somebody reported you or something that they they couldn't gossip or something like that and said that the, the owner said they couldn't, it wouldn't be good. So you want the team to sit down, come up with an agreement, how we plan to treat each other. And so they put in things like, you know, that they would support each other. They wouldn't talk about each other, that if something happened, they would confront each other or, or confront is probably the wrong word. They would talk about it. And that day they wouldn't go home and, you know, they wouldn't talk about it with other people. And, and it worked that team. Oh, wow. Hmm. And I even overheard one tell another one, wait, that's in, against our team agreement. Like she wouldn't hmm. engage in the gossip. So I think one of the most effective ways to handle this that I, that I've seen is that first off, never, ever talk about a team member to another team member. Okay. The leader should never, that's hard, but you should never do it. So if, you know, somebody rolls their eyes, don't laugh, you know, you, you have to have a good relationship with everybody. So you can't talk about anybody behind their back. You have to stay with a clean heart in that regard. Whenever somebody has an upset, you need to get both parties together in a private area. Don't allow people to fight in in front of the other team members. Go to a private area and get it clear. Hear one side of the story and the other. Let them both say it. You're going to get the truth that they're together. Hmm. They're together in the same room. You're going to get the story exactly the way it really is versus separately. Cause you can, I've interviewed, this has happened to me many times. I interview one interview, another, and then, and then you get them together and the stories are all different. <laughs> so mm -hmm. Bring them in the same room. And, you know, you have to create this culture in your practice that, that you guys have to get along. That's part of the culture. It's like, you know what, we're, we're not going to have gossiping and backstabbing in our practice. Oh, look, I've heard it all. You know, Susie, the hygienist, started date, dating, married uh, Jane's husband. I mean, I've seen all this stuff happen um, in offices. It's crazy. But, you you know, they have to respect one another. And it, that has to be part of the culture that they're a team. And that's how you're going to have a good work life. And everybody's going to get along. And the doctor sets that example. Hmm. Uh, not talking about other people and having truth and honesty and being ethical. And all of that is out in the open and those teams get along a lot better. Okay. Awesome. So uh, those are some real specifics in terms of doctors setting the standard by, by never talking about anyone behind their back or, or to other team members, but then also when stuff happens, cause it always will um, making sure that the parties who are involved talk about it together away from everyone else you sort it out and 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 that last step of building that culture of getting that team who would create a team agreement um i think that's one of the the hardest things to do and i i like it's almost like if you've got that culture you know it and you've got good people there and it makes such a difference in the stress levels in the the energy in the practice and if you don't have that and you've got a team who's not on the same page and, and doesn't have that culture, you can feel it and it wears on you and it drags on you. And it's something it's a it's an uphill battle every single day. And so that's something um, 
creating that culture is is a very cumulative thing. It's not like one magic bullet of, okay, team, we're going to have a better culture today. Um, but all of these things work together. Um, but it, but it starts with the leader. It starts with that example, and it starts with what you're about, the person that you are, the example that you set. And that's part of what this season is. And and we're going to talk more about leadership and we're going to talk more about culture. One more um, thing on that. You know what? Perfect. Can you believe, and this is, well, I believe it because I see it all the time. When the more structure the practice has, the less disagreements there are. Hmm. Does that make sense? So the yeah. more structure and agreements the less, the more agreements in place, the less disagreements you're going to have. Mm. In life, everything flows on agreements. No, that makes so much sense. And uh, you're 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 playing the same game. You've got a score to, to track together. You've got your systems. Everyone's got their accountability. Um, there's, I, th- I think, so much of the drama that arises comes from confusion. And it's like, well, you know this person said this, this person said this, what do we do? And and then, you know, people try and strong arm other people. So the more order, the more competence, the more training, the more accountability we have, the more a practice is going to flow like this. And people are going to be less stressed because they know right. how to be successful every single day when they come to work. That's exactly right. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, this has been a really fun exploration for me to kind of just pick your brain off the cuff about, you know, what does a leader look like and what are the different aspects of leadership? Um, And I I feel like we hit a lot of really specific things that you can do um, as a leader. And, and, And it's such a, it's a nuanced thing. It's a learning curve. And I think good leaders realize they're going to make mistakes. Team members are going to make mistakes. And it's about learning from those mistakes and moving forward. So I appreciate your your advice on all of this. Oh, yeah, it was fun. A lot of fun. Cool. Well, we will talk with you next week. This has been another episode, a, a special combined episode of Shared Practices and the Dental Drill Bits. Thank you, Sandy. We'll talk with you later. Thank you. Okay, that was a, a very packed episode of a lot of I feel bad because I I was all over the place, but Sandy kept delivering all these amazing little tidbits. And each one of those, we could have delved in deeper for another 10, 15 minutes on each one of those topics. Um, But I'm interested to hear what stood out to you because um, you're, you're getting to hear the insider perspective on like our industry coaching. You know, you've done a lot of coaching in other industries. You're hearing now the issues that dentist face and and someone who's been doing this for dentists for a long time. So what stood out to you? Well, uh, obviously what stood out to me is that a dentist has to get organized. A dentist needs leadership. A dentist needs to, is the one that kind of sets the tone uh, for everything that happens in a practice. Leaders bring the weather. And the, if the dentist is organized, the practice is going to be organized. And so uh, having a, having systems and processes and ways to communicate and talk to people make a huge difference because that allows everybody to kind of stay in their lane and do what they want to do. And, and in terms of getting people to do that, I think Sandy understands what exactly needs to happen there. I love that she said, don't be afraid of your team. Like, I think that um, there's just, there's a lot of fear around, and maybe you're not afraid of your team, but you're just like dreading bringing up stuff or changing or, you know, you just kind of know, hey, if we try and do this, this person's going to pipe up with this problem, this person's going to go silent, and you know your team and you know um, their strengths and their weaknesses and, and you just there there can be an internal resistance to holding people accountable, implementing systems, and all of that. And so that that concept of not being afraid of your team, I, I love that she brought that up. Well, and in fact, uh, when when it comes to change, you ought to expect resistance. Uh, there are just and and it depends. There were, when when you announce a change, there will always be people that raise their hands and say, "Oh, oh, oh, yeah, yeah, pick me, pick me, pick me," because they love change. But that's typically not the the average person. The average person is going to say, "Oh, I've got to do more work, and it's going to require me to do you know do things differently that I've done for years and years." And so you you almost ought to expect defensiveness and pushback, uh, and 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 welcome the defensiveness and pushback because if they're 
if they're being defensive and push pushing back, at least they're engaged. You know, if you announce a, a change to your team and and everyone goes, yeah, okay, uh, but they're not making eye contact, you know that they're just telling you what you want to hear and they're not really buying in. So, so part of the buy-in process is to get that resistance out in the open and again and expect it welcome it learn why people are resistant because when they tell you why it's resistant that'll help you figure out all the pitfalls you need to overcome in implementing new systems or changes so so just expect resistance whenever you're going to try and introduce anything new perfect um the the other comparison i really liked she liked uh to talk about a scoreboard and this idea of being a coach um, I, we're fresh off of the Super Bowl here. What did you think of that analogy? Oh, I, well, I love that. She said the coach is the one that's making it all happen. And I, quite frankly, I think a dentist job is 10 times harder and more complex than being in a coach. Because when you think about a coach, you know, the Kansas City Chiefs, Andy Reid, he's on the sidelines. He's watching the offense, the defense. He has assistant coaches. But she also mentions that a dentist is in the treatment room. So you're a coach where you're also a player and you're also not in the same room or, or being able to watch everyone at the same time. So I, I agree that the coach is a good analogy, but in some ways you're a coach and a player and you're a coach without all the information. So uh, it's, it's infinitely more complex to be a coach as a dental practice owner um, then, I mean, it's hard. It's, it's, it's not easy. So, you know, I hear her describing, you know, a uh, coach needs to do this, 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 and this. And I can imagine a, a dentist who's practicing and spending, I don't know, 30 to 70% of her time uh, treating patients, trying to figure out how do I get the rest of that time to do all those things that, that she's doing. So, so yes, uh, I love the analogy of a dentist being a coach. Um, and, uh, I think it's it's really tough uh, in order to be a practice owner and a dentist at the same time requires a high amount of self-awareness, a passion and commitment to really making a practice uh, work well. And I guess if if you're struggling with that, don't be surprised because it's such a tall task. I, I think um, the point you bring up there is that the default as a dentist you know, you said 60, 70, I would say 80, 90% of your time is in treatment and 20 to 10% of the time you're, you should be doing some of these other things, but it's so much easier to be in the, not easier, but it, it, it just happens that you're in the day to day in the moment to moment. You're seeing things from the patient care perspective. You're not up front coaching the, the front desk team. You're not watching the hygienist every moment. You know, you're in treatment. So it's not surprising that a lot of dentists don't step back and look at the numbers, that they don't step back and, and focus on coaching and leadership and systems and structure because doing the actual dentistry just requires so much time and stress and effort that by the end of the day, you're, you're just burnt out and want to go home. Um, so, so I think that default mode is to not be the coach and it takes a tremendous amount of effort to, to put yourself in that mode and to look at things from that perspective and to, to look at the numbers, to, to step back and see where things are trending. Because um, otherwise, you'll, you'll, you'll never do the coaching because it, it, it takes a different headspace and it takes a lot of work. Absolutely. And all the dental work is urgent. A patient needs uh, things fixed in their mouth. That's urgent. You know, you need to have billing. Those, those things are urgent. And so uh, a coach takes more of a long-term view than a practitioner, right? And so you've got to be able to have both a long-term and a short-term perspective and be able to switch from those two perspectives fairly fluidly. And that's that's not always easy uh, to be able to do that. And and so that's, uh, you know, that's why you need podcasts and, and information like Sandy provides because uh, it's it's just so important to, to be able to figure out what role am I supposed to be playing right now? And in that role, what exactly do I need to be doing and how do I need to be doing? Not just what do I do, but how do I do it in a way that actually works, in a way that that makes the difference that I'm trying to make? No, that's awesome. And, and then all of that kind of um, emphasizes her point of getting organized and getting systems in place because if you haven't built the systems, you haven't got organized then so much of the friction and the day-to-day 
is going to be putting out fires and disagreements and addressing each issue as it comes up. Um, so until you have that organization and that structure and those systems, um, it's it's always going to be especially hard to do that higher level coaching and, and thinking um, because you're just so pulled into not only the, the dentistry, but also just the daily drama that comes up from, from being in a dental office and working with other people, your assistants and your team members. For sure. It becomes a chicken and egg problem, which is, um, you know, do I need to get ahead? Do I need to get a little bit ahead so I have time to do that? Or do, do I do that first that allows me to get ahead? And if, if you say to yourself, well, I can't do those things until I get ahead, you'll probably never likely get ahead. You need to actually make a commitment to, to do those things in order to kind of get things under control. And if you don't do that, uh, you'll always end up, you'll never end up getting time to do that coach role. You'll always end up being in that pr practitioner role. And so um, it, it requires a leap of faith to say, you know what, if I take a little bit of time away from my practice, away from the chair, away from uh, direct billing, I can create these things that are going to pay off down the road. And and one last point to, to drive this in and we'll wrap it up. But the opportunity cost as a dentist, like you always have the the thing that you can say to yourself of if I was seeing patients instead of doing this, like doing one more crown or or you know one more procedure, um, that feels more productive in the moment than any of the other kind of working on your business because there's no direct production that results from working on your business, but there is direct production resulting from seeing patients. And so it can feel so hard to set aside time that's not patient care time to do that because the opportunity cost is high. Yeah. And that is so true because it not only feels more productive, you're, you're as a dentist, you're much better at it. So you will feel successful. Mm. You will feel like doing, you know, <clears throat> looking after patients uh, and doing work in someone's mouth, you know, that is a natural use of your talents. Whereas you, when you try and do the other thing, you're going to be in new territory. You're going to feel much less comfortable. You have much less experience and it will feel um, like you're back in the first year of dental school again, because mm -hmm. you're, you're kind of starting over. And so it's, it, the default is to go to something also that, that you feel more successful at rather than something that uh, is, is much more difficult for you. No, oh, absolutely. Well, this, this has been fun. This is, you know, I, I asked you to be a co-host for the season and you've been very gracious, not only in your interviews, but now also uh, doing the intros and outros. So I, I, I really enjoyed your perspective. Thank you for, for coming on the show. Oh, you're welcome. Happy to do it uh, as long as, as long as the season lasts, Rich. Cool. Well, we will talk with you next time on the Shared Practices Podcast. Okay. I'm excited to announce a partnership with Sandy Pardue. We are rebooting the Dental Drill Bits podcast. Sandy and I sat down and said, what if we did a podcast together? What if we did a whole season of, of your show together? And it works out perfectly because I have a ton of questions and she has a ton of answers. So we combined my skill at asking questions, but not necessarily knowing the answer and her skill at answering every single question with a wealth of knowledge, specific examples and experience. If you want to get your dental practice organized, if you have trouble with understanding the roles and the functions and the systems of your office, join us every Tuesday on the Dental Drill Bits podcast.